Hi! In previous episodes, we figured out why fake science or pseudoscience is dangerous and what shapes it can take. Now let's try to figure out what makes fake science so invincible. Imagine chatting with an old friend, a nice and intelligent person. Suddenly he or she blurts out something like NASA never sent astronauts to the moon or all Darwin has long been refuted or AIDS was fabricated by Big Pharma. Shocking! What happened? Can you still be friends with this person after what they said? Your friend's cognitive ability seems to be all right. He or she is quite sensible and well-educated. We can hardly explain fake science advocacy by personality deformation alone. A lack of good education is not to be blamed either. Okay, I want to share my personal experience now. An esteemed scientist, a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, was once doing a talk at one of the early Scientists Against Myth fora. The lecturer kept talking as usual, when suddenly he said he denied the global warming, adding that it was nothing but market manipulation. Really? Surely respected scientists like him must have a decent academic background, right? So, poor education is hardly the only reason why in this age of scientific progress, fake science is still very much alive and well. An increased demand for fake science has been observed since the 1950s. I'll give you some numbers. According to Michael Shermer, founder of the Skeptic magazine, over 30% of Americans believe that the UFOs are alien spaceships. 60% believe in extrasensorics, 40% believe astrology is a science, 32% believe in lucky numbers, 70% believe magnetotherapy is based on science, while 88% are positive that alternative medicine offers efficient treatment of diseases. The US population spends a total of $34 billion on alternative medicine per year, while 34% Europeans believe homeopathy to be based on real science. In 2013, over one-third of the U.S. population believed the global warming to be a myth. Surveys conducted around that time also showed that at least half of all Americans supported at least one conspiracy theory. Let's see what it's like in Russia. A 2021 survey showed that over half of Russians incorporated horoscope predictions in their decision-making. According to a 2020 survey, one-third of all Russians believed that aliens regularly visit Earth, while 49% were positive that NASA had faked its Apollo lunar landings. Let's try to figure out what could lurk behind this complex phenomenon known as fake science. Let's start with some important facts. First, you've got to keep in mind that fake science is an umbrella term for several disparate phenomena. As David Hecht, an American historian of science, rightfully remarks, various fake sciences have only one commonality – they're not part of real science. There are many differences between them. It would be an oversimplification to lump together various types of fake science and the arrangements that shape them. Conspirology underpins quite a few modern fake scientific beliefs, things like scientists, doctor, government and elite conspiracies. That said, most astrologists seem to be quite happy without a conspiracy theory at all. Another example, a flat earth advocate may seem to blatantly ignore basic scientific knowledge, while some creationists may have been top of their class in school, and yet they will both turn to the Holy Scripture to find support for their vision of the universe and humankind. However, creators of the so-called new chronology have no need for religious dogma, and they probably did well in school, but it doesn't make their doctrine any bit scientific. And there is another important thing. There's no division line between true and fake science that was given to us from above. This imaginary line depends a lot on what the scientific community agrees to consider to be science. The criteria of what is science are by no means immutable. They are only a consensus, they shift and change with time, and they tend to become even more rigid. So when someone keeps complaining that fake science continues to exist despite the development of true science, 
It's like complaining that the moon keeps on chasing you, despite your best efforts to run away from it. Fake science will probably always be there, just like the moon. Maxin is a great illustration of this. Thousands of years ago, any herb the shaman of your tribe treated you with was your medicine. A lot of medical practices that were commonplace in the 19th century would now be seen as sheer quackery, but they were within the framework of the then medical science. An approach known as evidence-based science was developed only in the late 19th century. Does that mean medicine wasn't a science until the middle of the 20th century? Phrenology is considered to be a classical example of a fake science. However, its founder, Franz Josef Gohl, was an outstanding scientist. He was the first to conclude, for example, that the bigger an animal's cerebral cortex is, the more intelligent it is. Another example of a fake science is alchemy. But alchemy was held in high esteem by the likes of Sir Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler, who dismiss them as obscurantists from today's standpoint. Critics often forget to take into account historical backgrounds when passing judgment on the great thinkers of the past. An example of this is an esteemed scientific journal accusing Sir Charles Darwin of propagating sexist and racist views and justifying colonialism. Darwin is blamed for not having had the mindset of a 21st century person. Darwin should surely have foreseen that some 130 years later, racists would be dismissed as non-existent, right? So, fake science not only exists, but it keeps on changing appearances as our notions of what is scientific change with time. What is considered science today may no longer satisfy the more stringent constraints of true science in the future. Remember this next time you look down on great scientists of the past. Please, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking here about changing the scientific paradigm, which may cause a fake science of yesterday to become a true one tomorrow, like scientists may recognize homeopathy or creationism as real science, and then we'd have to apologize to those we've ostracized for so long. Make no mistake, criteria of true science don't just change with time, they become more stringent. Creationism or some other fake teaching, which was dismissed as fake science, has zero chance of being recognized as true science in the future. That said, some of what is considered science today may no longer qualify as such in the future. And another important thing. Michael Shermer once said that smart people believe in silly things because they've developed a habit of defending the views they derived at irrationally. Humans tend to arrive at their convictions by irrational paths. A lot of people, including maybe ourselves, tend to adopt the views propagated by scientists without questioning for the same reasons that other people adopt fake science. And these reasons are not scientific, but rather of social nature. They are trust in authority and adherence to traditions, values and rules of a certain social group we identify with. These are ideas that were instilled in us in the childhood, plus our life experience. It is irrational reasons, not critical thinking, that make some of us trust in real and some of us in fake science. Let's just humbly accept this as an axiom. There are no psychological mechanisms that make people adopt fake scientific views. Spanish psychologists Fernando Blanco and Helena Machute write that those cognitive errors are part of a healthy and well-adapted psyche. They are part and parcel of our successful strategies that helped our earlier ancestors learn about the world around them, ensuring their survival. They help us cope with the vicissitudes of life. These are the same mechanisms that force us to make erroneous conclusions and make us believe in illusions. Let's just keep this in mind next time we're about to laugh at somebody who we think is off base. So, let's recap. The term pseudoscience or fake science combines many heterogeneous phenomena that may have different causes. As science develops with time, the criteria of what is scientific constantly get more stringent. People often form their beliefs, scientific or pseudoscientific, based on irrational reasons. 
Now I'll name a few causes of fake science, and then I'll dwell on each point in more detail. The first group of causes is related to how efficiently scientific institutions are functioning in a society. The second one is about a lack of education. The third one is to do with certain peculiarities of the human psyche. Then there are social-cultural causes. And last but not least, there are causes linked to how mass media function. Let's focus on each point in turn now. Let us start with the functioning of scientific institutions. First, scientific knowledge is a complex thing. And science tends to get more and more complex with time. The amount of accumulated knowledge is growing rapidly, while some of today's relevant knowledge is getting outdated just as rapidly as well. People who have made science a part of their life need to constantly upgrade their skills, for which purpose we have universities, scientific libraries, databases and professional events. Scientists have to deal with ever more complex scientific models that require mastery of complex math, expensive lab equipment, lots of computing power, and involvement of scientists from related fields of study. Scientific discoveries are no longer made by genius individuals. They are made by scientific teams and research institutions that may toil on one project for many, many years. Here's a 2010 science publication on deciphering the sequence of the Neanderthal genome. The appendix is a staggering 174 pages long, consisting of 19 parts, each prepared by special subdivision within the team of outstanding Swedish paleogeneticist Svante Pabo. The title page lists 56 authors. Although it was Pabo who won the Nobel Prize for this research, it is pretty obvious that work of this scope and depth could not have been carried out by a single scientist, even if he or she were a real genius. Or let's take, for example, Sir Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. It is well worth reading, by the way. This revolutionary scientific publication reads today as top-quality popular science. A lay reader shouldn't have any problem comprehending it. By contrast, if you try reading any present-day scientific article on biology, you might think it's written in some alien language, unless you are a professional biologist, of course. There's a massive knowledge gap between scientists and non-scientists, and it keeps on growing. This gap is especially deep where the level of education is poor, and taxpayers don't receive any explanations as to why they need to pay out of their pocket for yet another space mission or particle accelerator or some similarly expensive device that's very far removed from the daily needs of ordinary citizens. So this is where the taxpayer money goes to fund this stupid stuff, thinks an ordinary person. This or similar opinions regularly appear in the comments to scientific news. Misunderstanding breeds irritation, distrust, and ultimately fear. In one of my lectures, I mention a popular belief that science is a sort of elitist club. Instead of feeling proud for their nation's scientists who contribute to the country's prosperity and security, people tend to think of them as parasites, plotting evil stuff in their labs. And not that there was no reason for such an attitude at all. Haven't ordinary people been scared by the news of an impending nuclear conflict in the last 70 years or so? Add to this bioweapons and other scares. The most lethal weapon. What is it, if not the most monstrous product of a cynical scientific mind? So, misunderstanding of science will breed distrust and fear of science and scientists. On the other hand, in our society, which greatly depends on advancements in science and technology, science still enjoys a high level of respect. Paradoxically, people do need science, but not of the elitist and impersonal kind. Not of the kind where people pay for someone's curiosity out of their pockets. What people need is a sort of azot science or the masses that caters to people's wishes and hopes. Science educators in part help by making science more accessible and easier to understand. But the purveyors of fake science have succeeded the most. Another consequence of the complication of science is an increasingly narrow specialization of scientists. The Internet is full of sad professional jokes that go like, you're a doctor, surely you must know it, or you're a biologist, how come you're unaware of this? Surely a biologist must know how to get rid of parasites on your dog, or when it is the best time to plant carrot according to the lunar calendar. Or as a historian, you must remember all historic dates in all of the human history. In the Victorian era, when modern science was just emerging, someone like Sir Charles Darwin could pen scientific papers on such diverse topics as the geology of coral 
coral reefs, systematics of orchids, the body structure of barnacles, pigeon selection, psychology and paleontology. In the 21st century, though, if you're a barnacle expert, then you research only barnacles and no other creatures. A historian may spend their entire career researching the late medieval history of London. A linguist may spend decades studying the phonetics of the Tocharian language family. To quote Ambrose Bierce, Conwister, a specialist knows everything about nothing and nothing about everything else. End of quote. Niche specialization must be the inevitable price for high professionalism. So even a venerable scientist may lose their critical thinking beyond the scope of their expertise. Knowledge and experience are replaced by a set of memories instilled by TV and other media. And our scientist becomes just another lay person with a default set of stereotypes, prejudices and phobias. To put it another way, the scientific mode is deactivated, replaced by non-intellectual mechanisms. It's really sad when a person mentions their doctoral degree when trying to explain science, as if their degree automatically makes them an infallible expert in certain domains. Understanding the limits of one's expertise is an indispensable quality of a true scholar, but alas, not everyone is gifted with wise humility. No scientific merits make a scientist immune to false beliefs outside the scope of their scientific expertise, which may be in fact pretty narrow. Thus, venerable scientists may also become transmitters of fake science, while their reputation is brandished by their supporters. So beware when a specialist in radiation medicine declares that the theory of evolution has finally been refuted, or when a doctor of physics or math claims to have been cured by homeopathy. My next point is, the language of science is not only overburdened with smart words, but it is very formulaic and avoids categorical statements. According to psychologists Emilio Labata and Karen Zimmerman, scientists have a high degree of tolerance for ambiguity and questions that have no answers. This is hardly the kind of attitude we expect from someone we trust to be an expert. We turn to experts for advice in difficult situations. We expect an expert to explain our problem, give us consolation and advise us what to do next. We expect unequivocal answers, for they make our lives better. So what uses a scientific paper in a dire situation if most of them seem to end with the words further investigation required? No matter what the media say, science does not fall into crisis when one group of scientists refutes the conclusions of another. On the contrary, debate and competing theories speak of a healthy science, but things may look different to a lay person. Here is a typical comment under a video of a scientist's public lecture. Quote, possible, likely, we have a theory and so on. So does this scientist know anything at all? Give us a solid opinion, not a kid's babble, end of quote. And propagandists of fake science do give it a plenty. Psychologists say that authors of controversial theories are those that are more likely to voice their belief in a harsh, unequivocal manner which helps them gain public sympathy. The second group of causes is to do with poor education. When discussing the roots of fake science, people often mention the so-called education crisis. People are generally poorly educated. They have hardly any notion of physics or biology or other sciences. Some people can hardly write or spell their name. No wonder they fall easy prey to the voracious vermin of fake science. Public education these days seems to be suffering from a number of issues. According to a summer 2022 domestic survey, every third Russian believes that the sun goes around the Earth, a 7% increase over the last 15 years. Obviously, people with little education are easier to convince of any non-scientific stuff. Mao Zedong once said, you can write the newest, the most beautiful hieroglyphs on a clean piece of paper, end of quote. Let's say, for example, someone tells you that the Giza pyramids are first mentioned in literature only in the 19th century. Nobody in Europe presumably knew of their existence until Napoleon's campaign in Egypt of 1798. 
which means the pyramids must be a recent creation, or were specially built to attract tourists to Egypt. With proper knowledge of history, you may recall that Herodotus mentions the pyramids as early as the 5th century BC, and Pliny the Elder in the 1st century AD. Early Christians, Arab writers, and medieval European travelers also write of the pyramids of Giza. In the 14th century, a French baron named Danglia saw the locals remove the casing from the pyramids. The famous 15th century Chinese explorer Zheng He climbed to the top of the Great Pyramid during his visit to Cairo in 1414 to admire the view from above. Sir Isaac Newton himself does mention the Great Pyramid of Khufu in his work titled A Dissertation Upon the Sacred Cubit of the Jews and the Cubits of Several Nations. None of these facts is a secret, but you've got to do some learning first. If you lack the basic knowledge in history, you may be gullible enough to believe that all ancient monuments were built just 200 years ago. On the other hand, why should you take my word for granted? You shouldn't. One of the facts about the pyramids I've just mentioned is a fake. I've invented it especially for this lecture. Guess which one? What a twist! Carl Sagan once asserted that belief in pseudoscience is inversely proportional to understanding of science. But a wealth of knowledge alone cannot guarantee an immunity against fake science. I've mentioned scientists who have fallen prey to pseudoscientific information. The list goes on and on, and some of them are even pioneers of certain fake scientific doctrines, such as Peter Duisberg, a German-American molecular biologist, one of the proponents of AIDS denialism. We have examples of superstitious Nobel Prize winners, too, or of highly educated individuals who were practically engulfed by quackery. Take Steve Jobs, for example, who made a fatal choice of fake medicine. Research shows that people believe in UFO or creationism for reasons that have nothing to do with a poor understanding of science. And let me reiterate once again that fake science is very versatile. Education may help avoid one type of booby traps, but is helpless before other types. A 2008 publication showed that individuals with a higher education were much more likely to know that astrology is not a science. A 20th century survey showed a negative correlation between a college student's mean grade and their belief in the paranormal. That said, other surveys, which included other social groups, gave conflicting results. On the one hand, some pseudoscientific beliefs, such as ufology, are far less common among educated people. On the other hand, belief in extrasensorics and telepathy turned out to be more common among those with higher education. A 2002 skeptic publication revealed no correlation at all between knowledge of sciences and belief in the paranormal. Students with top grades in natural sciences were just as likely to adopt fake scientific beliefs as poor performers. It looks like they may be unable to apply their scientific knowledge to accurately evaluate information. Some psychologists think that simply sharing science with students is insufficient to protect them against fake science beliefs. Even teaching someone how to think critically may not do the trick. What teachers must do is hand over to their students a clearly defined set of methods for evaluating the truthfulness of scientific ideas. A special course would be required for that. In our next talk, we'll chat more about the causes of pseudoscience. We'll cover the most important ones, those to be found here.